Hi everyone, a very good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the book discussion. This book discussion is a series of discussion on the team, Five Fault Lines, Reflections on South Asian Frontiers under the ISIS CAS International Conference on South Asia 2021. Before we proceed with the event, I would appreciate if you could mute your videos and microphones throughout the session. If you have any questions to share with us, you can feedback them over the Zoom chat. We will consolidate your questions for the panelists to answer. This afternoon, we are delighted to have with us two authors to share their latest publication. Our first author is Dr. Nivi Machanda, Queen Mary, University of London. She's the author of Imagining Afghanistan, the History and Politics of Imperial Knowledge. Our second author is Dr. Thomas Simpson, University of Cambridge. He's the author of The Frontier in British India, Space, Science and Power in the 19th Century. Joining them in the discussion today will be Dr. Jasnia Sama, postdoctoral fellow here at ISIS, and chairing the session will be Dr. Rono Joy Sin, research fellow and research lead in politics, society and governance here at ISIS. I will now hand over the session to Dr. Rona Joy. Dr. Rona Joy, please. Thank you, Claudia. Um, a very good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all of you, whichever part of the world you are in. And a warm welcome to what is effectively the concluding session of ISAS's International Conference on South Asia, titled Five Fault Lines, Reflections on South Asian Frontiers. Over the past 10 days, which included a weekend and a national holiday, we've had intense conversations on what we termed the five fault lines of South Asia, namely the Durand line between Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Radcliffe line between India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, the McMahon line between India and China, the disputed lines in Kashmir between India, China, and Pakistan, and the Myanmar borderlands between India, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. The opening panel and the five round tables aim to understand and analyze the origins, legacies, and contemporary complexities of frontiers and borders in South Asia, and how they continue to impact contemporary politics in the region. The discussions were also intended to commemorate 75 years of the 1947 partition of the Indian subcontinent, which falls in 20, uh, 2022, that is next year. Today's session, focuses on two very recently published and exciting book. As Claudia mentioned, uh, Nivi Manchandra's Imagining Afghanistan, The History and Politics of Imperial Knowledge, published in 2020, and Thomas Simpson's The Frontier in British India, Space and Power, Space Science and Power in the 19th Century, published earlier this year. Both books have been published by Cambridge University Press. Both books and their subjects are central to the genesis of many of the issues that repeatedly came up and were debated over the past 10 days. While Nivi uncovers the distinctive place of Afghanistan in the imperial and anglophone imagination, Tom explores colonial interventions in the territorial fringes of British India, namely the Northwest and Northeast frontiers. Both authors highlight the intricacies and significance of the processes and technologies of knowledge production within the colonial frontier making project, even as they navigate uh, rich theoretical discussions on empire, state, power, gender, ethnicity, among other things. They also explore how the uneven geographies of the past continue to justify modern interventions and complicate interpretations of the borderlands and heartlands of these spaces in the present. With these few words, I now hand over the floor to Chastia to steer the discussion. Hi, thank you very much everyone for joining us. I'm extremely excited to have um, Tom Simpson, Tom, and Nivi Manchanda today to talk about their fantastic new books. So without further ado, Tom and Nivi, I'll give you 15 minutes each. Um, so the next half an hour is yours to reflect and give us an overview of your, of your books, um, as well as perhaps say a few things about your positionality and how we produce knowledge the way we do, um, perhaps reflecting a little bit more on your methodologies as well as you talk about your view. So the floor is yours. 
Um, Nivi, should we should we start with with your presentation? So, shall I share screen if you're happy? Fantastic. Thanks, Tom. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Thanks so much for inviting me today. It's a real pleasure. I'll jump straight into it. So imagining Afghanistan is loosely based on my doctoral research. And so it's been a very long project. At the time, I was interested in the war on terror and the US empire. So that's kind of my positionality, just like every other disillusioned grad student. But when it came to writing my PhD proposal, I was struck by the relative neglect that Afghanistan had been subject to, both in academic and popular discourse, especially compared to Iraq, even though this was the longer war. So this became the starting puzzle for me. Why was the war in or on Afghanistan obscured and Afghanistan considered only ever a peripheral subject of inquiry? As I delved into it, for me, this became about Afghanistan's liminal space in both imperial theory and practice. Afghanistan in some ways is both archetypal and the exception that proves the rule. We always focus on India or Algeria or the Congo to tell our story about colonialism. But colonization was a vast and sometimes not properly institutionalized endeavor. And this is what I call Afghanistan's quasi-colonial status, which helps illuminate its location on the margins of empire that make it both distinctive, but also add texture to the story of colonialism. The book examines Anglophone imperial representations of Afghanistan and there are two main time periods that it focuses on. In the first instance, the 19th and early 20th centuries, and the multiple British colonial incursions into Afghanistan during this period, and in the second, the 21st century, after the American-led NATO intervention, which constitutes the bulk of the book. My overarching impetus in the book is to tease out and unpack the racialized and taken for granted nature of colonial knowledge, which disguises itself as the only way of knowing. Afghanistan is fascinating because it's a strange place, it was never properly colonized the way in which India was, for instance, but it was subject to some very invasive restructuring by the British and then Russia and finally the United States. And yet it remains shrouded in mystery, narratives of the great game where Afghanistan is looked upon as a pawn between two meaningful entities, Russia and British India, or when Afghanistan is depicted as the graveyard of empires, a place where imperial ambition is obliterated almost by default without much engagement with the history of the region. So this brings me to the main objectives of the book and there are two, and I'm going to paraphrase from the introduction here. The first is to address what I see or what, what I saw when I was writing the book as a conceptual lacuna in international relations theorizing. That there remained a tendency to essentialize even in constructivist and critical work, the other or the third world or the global south or whatever other problematic term we choose to use. And the second was to look at a place that has always been considered marginal and to try and make the claim that what we say about this place, that is Afghanistan, actually says more about us and the processes of knowledge production in the West and specifically in the Anglophone Academy and policymaking than it does about Afghanistan. The book is methodologically eclectic. So I look at, at British colonial archives, academic research, policy documents, and media and film portrayals to present colonial visions of Afghanistan. These are by no means monolithic. Indeed, competing and contradictory representations help spotlight the anxieties that undergird the political economy of colonial knowledge production. Colonial knowledge and colonial anxiety are key themes in the book. The desire to capture Afghanistan, but never devote the resources necessary to this enterprise has resulted in a strange overdetermination of the country. There are a lot of very categorical claims made about Afghanistan that go largely unchallenged and unproblematized. Each of the chapters is devoted to one of these claims that become capstones of the imperial imaginary. So two of the chapters look at gender, which is key to the book, but also to Western intervention in the Middle East specifically, and the developing world more generally. Much of the NATO-led intervention was legitimized to the public through the discourse of saving Afghan women. Afghan women brutalized in burqas needed us. It was a moral duty to help these hapless women. 
And as many scholars have written, including Gayatri Spivak, Leela Abulagoch, and Der Mohanty, to name a few, the brown or the Muslim or the third world woman is always victimized and presented as the white man's burden in diverse and often quite intriguing ways. My intention in the chapter on women is not at all to say that there's no female oppression in Afghanistan, but rather that one, there's a tendency to posit the Western liberal woman as not only the norm, but also the apogee of the liberated woman, and two, that the voices of female revolutionary movements on the ground are drowned out in favor of American NGOs like Feminist Majority that don't really have a clue about what is going on on the ground and are divorced from the lived reality of women in Afghanistan. This means that Afghan women, and this is reminiscent of Bell Hooks's argument in Ain't I a Woman, are subject to a double whammy of local patriarchy and Western female nationalism. The other side of the gender question is the representation of men. And here the discourse gets really fascinated. Afghan, women, Afghan men are represented as queer sodomizers. There's a whole narrative about how they perform homosexuality because they're repressed, but also at the same time are portrayed as homophobes and wife beaters. The desire to conjure Afghanistan as a place of perversity and to teach gender normativity is really strong. And I tease out the ways in which the moral imperative in this libidinal economy of representation and intervention, and this ties in again with colonial anxiety, and more particularly when it comes to gender norms and rules, which Afghanistan seems to trouble. Another chapter is dedicated to the age old trope of Afghans as unruly tribesmen. And this chapter excavates the genealogy of the trope in the colonial archives and shows how it has been repurposed to make either the intervention seem more urgent, we must reform these backwards people or to show how we must accept their backwardness and work with these tribes in a language they understand. And that certainly is not the language of modernity. The chapter then goes on to show how party understanding of Afghan social organization is and how much of it is still based on one person, Mount Stuart Elphinstone's account from 1807. Temporality and the denial of covalness to borrow from Johannes Fabian is central to this chapter to show how images of retrograde warriors has been so vital to invasion. A final key trope is that of the failed state, which ties into all the rest of these. Afghanistan's state is construed as a failure, hijacked by terrorists, overrun by corrupt leaders and nasty warlords. Again, this denies our complicity in creating present day Afghanistan and rides roughshod over Afghanistan's complex history to be able to compress it in bullet points for Western comprehension. So I'll pick a couple of instances that bookend the text to concretize some of these. So some of what I'm trying to say. The first is on the screen, it's Artifact One. This is an image of an Afghan textbook from the 1980s. The school book, which uses bullets and Kalashnikovs as counting tools, is one of the items prominently on display at the National Army Museum, housed in its Conflict of Interest Gallery in London that opened, in the public, opened to the public in May 2013. It references apples and oranges alongside mujahid and jihad and uses rifles along with pencils as numerical aids. The National Army Museum notes, and I quote, the book dates from the Islamic year 1356, circa 1986, during the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Its warlike content is a stark reminder of the lasting legacy of conflict in the modern Afghan society, end quote. The exhibition's curator, Merid O'Hara, elucidates in great, de great detail the many ways in which war, and I quote again, is part of the fabric of daily life in Afghanistan. So to preempt hasty judgment, she explains that while using firearms as tools to learn how to count may seem sinister to us in the West, these objects compose the everyday reality of life in Afghanistan. So while these objects are very different from our everyday objects, they are the pedestrian objects of mundane life in their society. The textbook along with other exhibits on display may be read as a laudable attempt to bring the military intervention underway in Afghanistan at the time into popular consciousness of the citizens of a country whose army had been embroiled in a long and protracted war over there. What the exhibition and its curators fail to mention is how these textbooks came into being. During the mid 1980s, a USAID funded textbook, however, a USAID funded project printed millions of textbooks in Peshawar that were distributed to school children across Afghanistan. These textbooks were designed to indoctrinate Afghans against the evils of the Soviet Union 
and made for immensely powerful propaganda. Specialists from the Afghanistan Center at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, received 51 million US dollars to develop a curriculum which glorified jihad, celebrated martyrdom, and dehumanized foreign invaders. Published in Dari and Pashto, these school books taught the alphabet with images of Kalashnikovs counting through guns and bullets and had elaborate mathematical questions which drew on conflict scenarios, deploying various firearms in inventive ways for more advanced years. To take one example, and I quote, a Kalashnikov bullet travels at 800 meters per second. A Mujahid has the forehead of a Russian in his sights 3,200 meters away. How many seconds will it take for the bullet to hit the Russian's forehead? Although USAID funding for the project stopped in 1994, multiple copies of the text remained in circulation in the 1990s and into the 2000s. The Taliban, in another grisly turn, continued using these American-produced textbooks, but in keeping with their fabricated scripture that denounced all pictorial representation of human images, removed the heads of people in the books. What remained were images of decapitated bodies carrying Kalashnikovs poignant pedagogical instruments for eight-year-olds. This story of the Afghan textbook is important because it entirely disavows our complicity in creating the very warlike Afghanistan we study from an ostensible distance. This narrative also highlights the politicized nature of knowledge production. We know from Edward Said that the self is always already implicated in the production of the other, and this leads often unwittingly to the reification and reinforcement of power hierarchies in relations between the West and the East or the North, North and the South. But equally, the deliberate writing out of our involvement and imposition of me misleading narratives is a particularly pernicious and consistent problem when it comes to Afghanistan. Moving on to artifact two, the second slide. Here's a final image from the book's conclusion. Thanks, Tom. It's called Really Big Coloring Books, Book of Freedom. Just in time for the new year in 2014, a publisher based in St. Louis published, um, published a book, a series of coloring books, I should say, for children across the US. Really Big Coloring Books has updated its versions of We Shall Never Forget 9-11, the Kids Book of Freedom, in order to reflect the current political climate and the new terrorist threats the, book, the world is facing. This second edition, and I think now there's a third, uh, includes the Boston Marathon bombing, Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, ISIS, and the release of the Taliban bombers in contrast to the first volume, which centered on Al-Qaeda as the preferred object of line art for school children. The company, which mainly prints books on fairy tales and superheroes, released its first terrorist themed textbook, we shall never forget, in 2011 followed by another graphic coloring text, The True Faces of Evil, Terror in 2012. The company also released terrorist trading cards for children. Both books are now accompanied by a featured supplement, The Terror Update on Global Jihad. This terror update showcases a rather vivid picture of a public crucifixion by ISIS, which, to which the caption reads, and I quote, this is what ISIS wants to bring to America and its people. What are you going to do when they come for you? It also features pictures of the Taliban A5, the five Taliban detainees who were released in exchange for Sergeant Berdal. And I quote, the Obama administration broke the law by freeing five tal Taliban terrorists. The page reads and follows promptly with this pithy injunction. And I quote again, back to the battlefield. The original 9-11 books had the, as their focal point a picture of a Navy SEAL pointing a gun at Osama bin Laden the latter depicted cowering behind a veiled woman. The message next to the text, uh, next to the image was, children, the truth is, these terrorist acts were done by freedom-hating Islamic Muslim extremists. These crazy people hate the American way of life because we are free and our society is free. Really book, a really big coloring books has provided copies of its terrorism series to all 50 states and the White House. The founder of the company, Wayne Bell, declared in a video statement, and I quote, our books tell the truth. They tell it often, and they tell the children. These books that actually explain what's going on today. We're trying to educate the country on these animals, these brutal people, 
these terrible humans on the planet called ISIS, these terrorists, end quote. In an interview with the Daily Beast, Bell maintains that the books were instructional and taught positive values and that they were important for people in the US. These people in the US, they don't understand, he says. They don't have pictorials to show children. It's a delicate topic and it needs to be explained in black and white. This is happening overseas, not here, but it could happen here. So that's why we are making them, he says. My presentation, like the book, had an anecdote that captured the ways in which knowledge was produced about Afghanistan, about how it is generated and marketed in the US and repackaged to construct Afghanistan as an inexorably war-prone nation, marked by its failure and always already imprinted by a difference. Whilst the incident regarding the publishing and dissemination of numerous e-books for Afghan school children can be thought of as an act of, or a series of acts of willful forgetting and selective omissions, the publishing of these coloring books in the US for consumption at home, which dehumanizes and invalidates an entire people, may be thought of as an act of premeditated remembrance, remembrance and calculated commemoration. The Afghan textbooks are deployed as instruments of amnesia and the Amer American ones as mnemonic devices. This selective remembering and forgetting is central to pedagogy. I'm going to stop here about the book, but I want to just sneak in two things that I think I would have liked to explore in more detail or where the book falls short. One is that I don't fully explore the implications of capitalism and specifically racial capitalism in the story about the West's engagement with Afghanistan. And the second is that I also fall into the trap of treating the colonial archive as some sort of repository of truth and knowledge. And I think in retrospect, I would have liked to take more inspiration from the works of people like Sadia Hartman and Stephanie Smallwood to, Smallwood to look at the erasures, silences and occlusions of the archive and look at what the archive does not or refuse to contain. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Nivi. Uh, <laughs> so I guess I'll sort of pick straight up uh, where I left off, uh, uh, where you left off. Um, and well, first of all, I want to thank uh, not only Nivi, but also um, everyone at NUS um, who has been instrumental in putting uh, this event and indeed all the roundtables over the past few weeks on. Um, it's been really inspirational to uh, be part of at least some of those roundtables, not as many as I, I would have liked. Um, but some, um, and I've really thoroughly enjoyed, um, well, being, being part of it, and it's lovely to speak to everyone today uh, a little bit about my book. Um, so basically, uh, in these introductory remarks, I'm going to try to give um, a flavour of sort of what inspired me to uh, begin researching about a decade ago now, um, the frontiers of 19th century colonial India. And before then moving on to give uh, a necessarily brief summary of a few of the scholarly interventions that I try to make in the book um, and concepts that I work with in the book. Um, so to begin with uh, this question of, of why I wrote the book at all. Um, and I think there's, there's basically two ways to answer this. Um, one is more kind of historiographical or theory focused um, and one perhaps better captures my, my personal kind of fascination and investment um, in the topic. So the, the more, uh, dare I say dull, uh, but <laughs> the more scholarly um, answer is that I think that bringing together various themes, regions and fields of study that the book uh, attempts to cover into conversation with each other sheds light on each of them in turn. So basically I try to show how colonial power and knowledge um, at the Northwest and Northeast frontiers, and indeed, of course, various kind of subsections of those frontiers of British India, not only shared key features, um, but that agents of empire often connected um, these uh, discrete and far removed regions um, imaginatively and materially. I also try to argue that um, across the field sciences of surveying and ethnography, and also in practices of state power, such as rendering borderlines, deploying military violence, um, frontiers were what, what I term productively problematic um, for a whole range of imperial personnel. And I'll talk a little more about this in just two minutes, but, but basically by this term, prob uh, productively problematic, 
I essentially uh, pick up a little on Antoinette Burton's um, idea that um, frontier environs and people were troublesome um, in ways, or were deemed troublesome, were coded as troublesome um, in ways that soldiers, administrators, um, men of science valued. Um, and in fact, it, many times they valued the, this uh, trouble so much that they spent a lot of time and energy actively provoking much of this trouble um, and then sort of hiding their own complicity in provoking that trouble. So I'll go on to give a few examples of what I mean um, a little later. The more personal answer to why I wrote the book is that I suppose I, I was fascinated, um, or I have long been fascinated, by the apparent capacity of colonial India's frontier regions to disrupt and reshape the expectations of agents of empire. And I suppose equally to disrupt our expectations um, as scholars today of the kind of modes of thought um, and the types of activity that agents of empire engage in. Um, and I've been fascinated by this really ever since my, my master's degree, which slightly scarily was back in 2009, 2010, so quite some time ago. And I can still remember quite vividly being on um, a bus in London. I was at the London School of Economics um, that year reading George Curzon, recently retired Viceroy of India's uh, 1907 lecture on frontiers. And I found that in an otherwise incredibly sort of stodgy um, and, I mean, just archetypically high imperial text, um, there was this sort of almost electrifying moment when Curzon abruptly turns towards the very end of his lecture from arguing essentially, as he has for the, you know, the preceding bulk of the lecture, that the British Empire, according to him, is driving this kind of evolutionary uh, process towards rationalised fixed borderlines. And he turns from this towards what on the face of it is a totally contradictory notion that frontier making is, in his words, an art rather than a science after all, and that precarious, nebulous frontier zones, uh, rather than fixed, you know, stable, linear borders, are absolutely essential to the making of empire and the making of young British male selves. And so I, I kind of found this ambivalence just completely you know, intriguing um, and really striking. Um, and in some ways, uh, well, I mean, I should say, I sort of analyzed this a little in the conclusion of my book, uh, that particular episode, um, Curzon's lecture in 1907. But in some ways it kind of encapsulates uh, you know, my main fascination with analysing the British Empire from at least some of its edges, some of its peripheries. Um, and I think the book as a whole can be read as my attempt to kind of grapple with, to understand the roots of Curzon's contradiction and its various, you know, very different manifestations um, through the 19th and early 20th centuries. So that's a little on why I wrote the book and what some of my motivations are. Um, one of my central aims in the book, and I suppose one of my interests more broadly now as someone who's trained as a historian, but who now works uh, between a geography department and a history and philosophy of science department here in Cambridge, um, is to connect and to bring into conversation um, disparate historiographies and bodies of theory. Um, I always hope that I don't do any of them too great a disservice in sort of taking a little from these many sub-disciplines. I think, um, I mean, Nivy's book is an absolute sort of standout example of how to, um, you know, be methodologically diverse and do it really well. Um, and I at least hope that I manage uh, not to irritate too many uh, specialists um, in my attempt to do, to do similarly. Um, so I might just take a few minutes to, to outline a couple of the, the kind of scholarly fields that I work with in the book um, that I that I feel are really important um, to, to, to my work. So the first of these scholarly fields um, are histories that engage in close readings of primary material to investigate how colonial and uh, I suppose some of the scholarship focuses on post-colonial um, rule um, often depends on forgetting or overlooking or occluding uh, information rather than just accumulating and disseminating 
Um, again, I think there's a really sort of interesting resonance with what Nivy's just said and with her book more broadly um, in, in this point. Um, I don't think that this is a particularly consolidated sort of sub sub discipline that I'm trying to work. It's rather one that I, I suppose I've tried to construct and sort of pull together various works that I've been lucky enough to encounter over the past decade or so. Um, so especially important to me are Anne Laura Stoller's um, work on the Dutch East Indies, um, uh, some scholarship on, on colonial Africa, particularly by Keith Breckenridge and Helen Tilly, um, on I guess the willful limitations of British knowledge in Africa. And then also work uh, that falls again more within sort of uh, Nivy's remit in lots of ways. Um, I suppose work on uh, anthropologies of the state, and I'm thinking here particularly of Naimika Matur's um, brilliant work on uh, the state's strategies of inaction um, in contemporary upland India. So this idea of um, you know <laughs> state building and state rule. Um, governance resting on forgetting, overlooking and occluding rather than accumulating and disseminating information is one sort of really key feature of, of my book and something that I try to draw out throughout. The second thing that I look at, um, I suppose, spans uh, legal histories of empire, such as Lauren Benton's work, um, and also work in political geography by Stuart Eldon, John Agnew and others. Um, and basically this is all on the sort of fragmentary and contested processes through which sovereign territories are constituted and then reconstituted, reconfigured, um, differentially imagined by different actors. And so this relates to, but I, but I think goes a little beyond um, a lot of scholarship on frontiers, which is rooted in a focus primarily on settler colonies, um, especially in North America, and therefore tells of uh, a kind of broad shift over the course of the 19th and perhaps very early 20th centuries um, from, in the famous words of Edelman and Aaron, um, borderlands to borders, that is from these sort of hazy zones to fixed borderlines. Um, I suppose working with scholarship such as Benton, Eldon, Agnews, um, I try to suggest that this doesn't really stack up in the case of colonial South Asia. And while there is certainly a lot of attention to linear borders, um, the sort of reality uh, of uh, border making processes was way more contested by multiple agents, both within and outside the colonial state. Um, so that's the sort of second major kind of subfield that I work with. Third, I want to contribute to um, conversations among historians of British India about how colonial power and knowledge functioned in the subcontinent. Um, I found the work in this respect of particularly John Wilson at King's London um, and a whole range of others, it should be added, who have attempted, I guess, to move beyond a sort of dichotomy of, on the one hand, colonial rulers, a sort of shallow um, enterprise, and on the other, colonial rule and indeed knowledge is somehow kind of all encompassing. Um, I found that John Wilson's work to go beyond that dichotomy has been particularly useful um, for me in analysing regions in which the state was without doubt frequently ineffective on its own terms and internally fragmented, while also being spectacularly and enduringly destructive. <laughs> so Again, there's this sort of apparent paradox in that. And I think that working with the likes of Wilson's, um, you know, suggestive kind of works in the last decade or so um, helps, helps me, I hope, to unpick that in the book. And then finally, uh, just a word on how I relate to scholarship on, on frontiers in South Asia. Um, so the, the past decade and a half, as I'm sure you know, everyone in this virtual space uh, will know only too well, has seen um, an explosion of absolutely brilliant work on the edges of the imperial subcontinent. And I guess I seek to contribute to this um, in, in a number of ways. So first of all, I try to take historiographical trends that have previously been largely confined either to analyses of the Northwest or to analyses of the Northeast and see how far they can be applied and in what ways they can be applied to the other side of British India. Um, and in one case, especially, I guess, I found that two works that have been you know, particularly important to me, um, each of which attends to a different side of the imperial uh, subcontinent, fitted rather nicely together. Um, 
I'm thinking here of Ben Hopkins and Magnus Marsden's concept of fragments uh, of the Northwest frontier um, and Mandy Sedan's uh, notion of a fractal frontier in Northeast India and indeed Northern and Eastern uh, colonial Burma. And I really feel as though these kind of concepts have a lot to say to each other. They kind of resonated with each other and certainly with me as well. Um, this though brings me to an instance, I guess, of my second kind of intended contribution to um, this scholarship on frontiers in uh, Imperial South Asia. And that is that I tried to suggest that fragments and fractals were not qualities of frontier space and populations that agents of empire sort of simply suffered, that they, you know, tried to overcome, but kind of variously failed to do so. Instead, I tried to argue that agents of empire often actively embraced and sought to foster such forms of complexity and fragmentation. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk about that in more detail um, a bit later. So I'd now just like to turn to briefly, very briefly, introduce uh, two of the key concepts that I develop um, in the book. The first is the idea uh, which I set out uh, initially very early in the introduction um, that, as I put it in the introduction, British agents of empire conceived of frontiers as productively strange or um, alternatively as sources of productive difficulties. I alluded to this a little earlier in what I've just said, um, but I just want to draw that out. So this concept of frontiers as you know, seen by agents of empire as strange, difficult, problematic, troublesome is a thread that runs throughout the book. And by these terms, I essentially try to capture the sense that um, frontiers disrupted conventional and easily scalable colonial ways of, or scalable, rep, rep, uh, replicable um, colonial ways of knowing and acting. Ways of knowing and acting, that is, that could be codified, specified, and sort of repeated without major variation um, at different times and in different spaces. And then productive, this term productive refers to the fact, which I really try to establish throughout the book, that agents of empire didn't just suffer these disruptions. They worked with these disruptions, um, in many cases, kind of actively embracing and even deliberately seeking to produce such disruptions. So in other words, the challenges of frontier environs and peoples as perceived by agents of, of uh, imperialism, didn't so much negate British colonial power and knowledge um, at the fringes of the subcontinent, but rather generated particular modes of colonial power and knowledge that were predicated on um, sort of <laughs> the supposed need for uh, colonial agents on the spot to have freedom of action and the capacity to do things according to their judgment of what was necessary in that place at that time. In other words, their ability to respond um, in a sort of, in real time to variability uh, and to challenges. And in trying to unpack this in the book, I, I play around with Foucault's notion of power as productive of new relations rather than something that is sort of simply limiting and restrictive. So I would say that this is certainly true um, or, the, the, you know, the same is true of sort of forms of resistance to cl conventional colonial methods. These didn't mean that the colonial state simply failed, but rather that its functionaries generated alternative methods. Um, so ultimately, then, the ostensible difficulties and strangeness of frontier spaces and peoples as perceived by agents of empire was, I think, productive of distinctive ways of knowing and governing. And then finally, another concept that I return to throughout the book is an idea of frontier forgetting. So a key argument of the book is that colonial power and knowledge uh, at India's frontiers didn't only operate through the accumulation of materials and then their sort of steady uh, kind of orderly dispersal, as I suppose many accounts that invoke some notion of the colonial archive often implicitly or otherwise propose. Instead, I tried to unpack this idea that forms of forgetting played essential roles in shaping British India's frontiers. So sometimes forgetting resulted from errors and inadequacies within the colonial state. Um, you know, communications were lost, materials were fragile and broke in transit, 
those kind of uh, things. But I'm especially interested in forms of more deliberate um, forgetting, um, which I tried to suggest were not quite ubiquitous, but were certainly very much commonplace. Imperial personnel often willfully occluded information or emphasized the impossibility of adequately representing frontiers in written or visual forms. Or, uh, and this was uh, a particular mode of frontier forgetting that I suppose I became very interested in, in sort of seeking to, to uncover, um, or they often overlooked um, kind of proximate instances in which a policy that they were suggesting, a course of action they were suggesting had been tried and had failed. Um, and instead favoured these kind of long distance, often quite speculative or fantastical um, imaginaries and comparisons. So one striking instance of this, um, just to ground this in some sort of sense of case study material uh, that I detail in the book, concerned uh, a soldier administrator in the Kasi Hills um, in Northeast India in the early 1830s. Um, and this particular administrator um, essentially tried to repeat um, a, a policy that only a few years before in this very area had led to a you know, huge episode of violence. Um, and in order to do so, he turned to invoking uh, the American frontier that he'd read about in the classic uh, Western novels of James Fenimore Cooper. Um, so rather than looking to this much more proximate and on the face of it, directly relevant example of failure, there was this kind of fantastical imaginary that took uh, you know, any reader of his missive halfway around the globe um, and obviously was based on a heavily fictionalized uh, and idealized account. Um, I'm just going to draw to a close very briefly, and I think I'll only talk for about another minute, so <laughs> there won't be too much more. Um, but this is a question that I suppose has often been asked. So I thought I'd just say a little about sort of what exactly I mean by frontier in the book, what kind of counts as a frontier for my purposes in this book. One of the key aims of the book is to focus on British India's frontiers as um, an emic category. That is, you know, how agents of empire understood and configured frontiers. Um, so in a rather simplistic sense, my definition of the frontier sort of should be, or aims to be, uh, an attempt to capture their definition of the frontier and what counted as major frontier space. Now, of course, imposing some kind of definition around, you know, my object of study in terms of prioritizing certain things and excluding or underplaying others is, is inevitable. Um, you know, the, the term frontier is invoked more widely than I can account for um, in, in the book. Um, so, you know, the study is limited primarily to Baluchistan, um, to the area that later became, uh, in the very early 20th century, uh, Northwest Frontier Province, um, plus uh, adjacent mountain regions to the north of Kashmir, and then going to the northeast, the region that became Northeast Frontier Tracts, it, in the early 20th century, and then the irregularly governed upland zones south of Assam and east of Bengal. And I think that that kind of you know, imposition um, of, of that particular geography of the frontier is justified by the significance of these areas to British imaginaries and constructions of India's frontiers in general. Um, although, of course, it is also partly a sort of practical choice on my part to give some shape and focus to the book. But I also conclude that for agents of empires, India's frontiers were not just these kind of specifiable spaces um, that could be you know, demarcated on a map and sort of pointed at. Um, but they were in really important ways, kind of first and foremost, a, a more conceptual um, object. Um, as I put it in the conclusion, uh, and uh, you know, they were sort of came to be largely defined in imperial imaginaries as perpetually open and mutable zones defined by challenging experiences. And this statement is my attempt to sum up how agents of empire operating across various fields from you know, the military to field sciences and in administrative roles sought to, you know, sought not to reduce frontiers to linear, clear, fixed borders, but rather to maintain them as hazy areas in which challenges went hand in hand with particular forms of knowledge and power in which they, as agents of empire, 
had significant freedom of action. Okay, so I've spoken for long enough. <laughs> um, thanks for bearing with me. And perhaps I'll hand back over to Jasnir, um, who I think might get a broader conversation started. Hi, um, Nivi and Tom, thank you so much for that fantastic overview. Um, I mean, I couldn't have done a better job than you did because I've been reading both of your books um, over the past two weeks. And I have to say, while I was isolating, I read them side by side um, with each other. And obviously, these books have, you know, both of your books have so much going on, um, particularly because, Nivi, you go from history to the contemporary. And um, Tom, you talk about 19th century with fantastic archival work um, as well. So it's it's kind of unfair to put these two books together and yet so productive um, because it helps us to tease out some of these themes that we've been talking about as we had these conversations in this, in this conference. And one of that is this idea that, you know, we keep talking about frontiers and frontiers historically has always been constructed as somebody else's space where which can be trampled upon and appropriated and expropriated for um, somebody else. And Anna Shing's foundational insight on frontiers is that it's always a traveling project. However, it takes localizations to come to life. Um, and throughout the conference, we've been talking about how frontiers are actually homelands. I mean, I'm living in one of these old frontiers, you know, and, uh, uh, and in my own work, of course, I also think about these places as places of belonging or non-belonging, of citizenship determination. And um, it's really essential, and both of your books really provoke this idea of frontiers as homelands and um, in, in their own different ways. Um, although, you know, uh, Tom, you, you think about this through, you know, colonial uh, frontier agents interpretation, and Nivi, you talk so much about um, frontier inhabitants as well across history. And the other thing that I thought was thematically interesting um, in both of your books was that it provokes us to, to understand what exactly were those processes of knowledge production that systematically led to us in the contemporary imagination of these places. Um, Nivi, I mean, in your book, you go from history to modern Afghanistan, interpreting all of the discourses in which Afghanistan has been constructed as you know, failed state, which we, when we study Burma, for example, is we've always talked about how failed state kind of recalibrates this idea that failed states must somehow be rescued and saved. And then again, as the wild frontier, as the graveyard of empire where, you know, marauding armies go to die, or the buffer zones of, of kind of like the great game, which Nivi, you mentioned, is basically the imagination of uh, a British a colonial obsession with Russian um, expansion. Um, and all of this construct this place as this barbaric land, wild, um, of tribal feuds, which again is a very problematic concept that maybe you talk about in great details. Um, and all of these tropes that, that are percolated across the media, across our common understanding, across popular media, even Khaled Hosseini's no novels, for example, creates our understanding of what exactly is Afghanistan and what exactly is the frontier spaces that we have inherited from the British Frontier Project. Um, so that's that was one of the most interesting things that I thought I will ask you to expand on a little bit more with case studies because you have amazing vignettes. Um, and Tom, your book also, for example, really goes into um, kind of dispelling another sort of trope which is the idea that there was this colonial project, the British imperial project, and then they encountered frontier populations that were savages and had to be civilized somehow. And that was it. And of course, we've had critical concepts like James Scott and the art of not being governed and the Somia theory and state escaping people. And, but you put into the mix the ingredients of the frontier agent who we thought um, were just, you know, British men of a particular class who went to Oxford and Cambridge, drinking sherry, wearing their red coats, and then coming out and then pointing to the to um, basically delineate territories that has been so catastrophic even to the current times. Um, and but you go on to say that these were extremely haphazard, um, and all of the things that these British colonial um, officers and agents and surveyors, mappers, ethnographers, anthropologists employed, um, were basically kind of looking at it as chaos as a ladder, as, you know, frontier forgetting, including. Um, so I just thought that this was, both of these things 
create tropes in our contemporary understanding that we need to constantly problematize. Um, so my first question to both of you really is um, to see if you feel there are any kind of differences, similarities, um, convergences, ebbs and flows uh, between the historical con construction of these terms, as well as the way in which we kind of use them in the modern era. So I'll just leave the stage to you and then um, whoever wants to come in here. Um, I'm more than happy. Nivi, do you, do you want to start, given that I've talked more than enough, or should I get going with it? <laughs> Why don't you get going with it? Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, th thanks, Justine, for, you know, such kind of generous, productive reading <laughs> of uh, both of our works. I'm, um, you know, certainly sorry that you, uh, you know, had had my book for company during, <laughs> during your recovery from COVID. Um, but, uh, you know, I hope it proved vaguely interesting. Um, so, I... Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, I picking up just on a, a kind of a couple of the core things that you've just mentioned, as you know, I try to deal with them in my book. Um, and I think, you know, these are sort of two elements. Well, one of these elements, um, this idea of sort of the tropes that inform our imagination of, I guess, in my case, you know, colonial India's frontier regions and their post-colonial instantiations, um, and then in Nivi's case, uh, Afghanistan. Um, I think there's a real resonance between my work and Nivi's work. I found myself reading um, Nivi's book and sort of nodding <laughs> furiously <laughs> along repeatedly. Um, and I suppose one, one of the, you know, the things that strikes me as uh, kind of fundamental to both of our works, although I'm sure we go about it in quite different ways, um, is that, you know, in my case, frontiers were and largely continue to be frequently defined by these kind of supposed lacks or absences. And I think you've just alluded to that just near, but um, you know, an absence of state, an absence of law, uh, a relative perhaps absence of population, um, absence of agriculture, <laughs> um, all of these supposed lacks. And you know, these imaginaries are, I mean, problematic in sort of so many you know, more sort of straightforward ways. They're pejorative, they're violent, they're disingenuous, they willfully and, you know, abruptly and violently ignore um, the complexities and richness of um, Frontier's life, as, as you put it, Justin, you know, the, the, the basic fact that these are other people's homelands <laughs> um, is kind of trampled over um, in, in many of these, uh, th these kind of go-to tropes. Um, of the frontier and indeed of Afghanistan. Um, I also, I think, try to suggest in, in my book that they, they also underplay the degree to which the colonial state and many of its agents, particularly those engaged kind of in person in frontier regions, actually, you know, sort of over-determined frontier space. And I think this, again, is something that Nivy deals with <laughs> in her book, that idea that, you know, this isn't just a sort of space defined by absence and kind of evacuation. Um, it's actually kind of excessively <laughs> discussed and, and coded and engaged with. Um, and so in the case of frontiers um, in the 19th century, you know, there are these sort of constant attempts and sort of highly uh, repetitive, frankly, uh, attempts to, to categorize and subcategorize frontier regions, to implement these kind of, you know, specific definitions and structures. Um, and the, the, you know, the paperwork, the sort of ink that is spilled over these, not to mention then the blood that was often spilt as a result of, you know, the very kind of real physical attempts to implement some of them on, on the ground. Um, is you know it's enormous <laughs> in quantity and you know it, it's I think the repetitiveness um, of those debates again this comes back to my idea of frontier forgetting in my opinion um, this ability to forget that these schemes often had already been tried and had already sort of conspicuously failed on their own terms and then were tried again and again and again <laughs> um, is, is, you know, a really major feature um, of, of these tropes. So the, the sort of simplified trope not only, you know, does great damage and violence to, you know, the sort of richness of frontier life, but it also actually radically kind of underplays the degree to which these were spaces of 
you know, intensive, if very irregular and, you know, at times very weird um, forms of colonial intrusion. Um, and I, yeah, for, from what I, you know, uh, understand of Nivy's work, um, that that's a real sort of major point of overlap um, in, in our sort of understandings. Um, just very quickly on the James Scott point, if I may. <laughs> Sorry, I've taken up too much time in uh, talking about the, what I take to be this point of overlap. Um, I mean, uh, the first thing I should say is reading James Scott for the first time, whenever that happened, probably a little over a decade ago for me now, was one of the most kind of wonderful revelatory experiences. And I think that his work is sort of utterly brilliant in terms of reach and sort of provocation and clarity of thinking. I do, though, very much take issue with this, his tendency at times to kind of homogenize both state actors and non-state actors. Um, and so I guess my book primarily is kind of interested in going slightly against his characterization of state knowledge always kind of aiming at least, aspiring to a form of uniformity, um, which I, I guess he, uh, James Scott, discusses most in Seeing Like a State. Um, and a corollary of that is uh, that you know, in ta the, the kind of entanglements, the encounters that I am interested in between frontier communities and colonial state actors, you know, during the long 19th century were much more multifaceted than could be accounted for by this model of, of you know, frontier peoples as, as state evaders um, that Scott developed in The Art of Not Being Governed. Um, so, you know, basically, I think that Yes, it's absolutely the case that, you know, these were regions where colonial states were very much kind of hampered by variants on sort of what Scott terms friction of terrain. Um, and also, I suppose, by, um, you know, friction of kind of <laughs> particular forms of community making. Um, it's also the case that state actors undoubtedly kind of engaged in much more complex and variegated structures of, um, you know, interaction of, of you know, a, a vast array of kinds with communities throughout what Scott would call greater Zomia um, than, than Scott's model allows for. Um, and I suppose in this respect, I found Nivy's concept of quasi-coloniality like very much pertinent to these ideas. I mean, particularly, I think you put it, Nivi, you know, your characterization of indirect rule in your introduction to the book sort of really resonated <laughs> with my thinking on this point. The idea that indirect rule is every bit as invasive as direct rule, but never fully operationalized um, was one of the many points where I found myself sort of nodding along. Anyway, that's more than enough from me. Um, <laughs> but those and, are some thoughts that I started. No, no, Tom, that really segues very nicely into the other question I was going to ask Nivi is about this idea of uh, to let you elaborate a little bit more on quasi-coloniality, which if I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, which, you know, is basically, it was colonized and yet never colonized, but always at the mercy of colonization. Um, and you also talk about like, you know, in the, hist in the historical context, the Amir um, was uh, getting cash subsidies from British India. So when the boundaries were demarcated with a, particularly the Durand line, then uh, uh, they just, you know, agreed to most of the terms. And you also talk about how frontier capitalism falls into this domain. For example, capital was detracted from Afghanistan after the creation of them. Um, and so that's why I, after the creation of boundaries, let me finish my thought there. Um, so I'll just allow you to say, you know, a couple of things about quasi-coloniality, please. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks, uh, Tom, uh, for engaging so deeply with my Work. I want to read your book. I ordered it, but I haven't received it yet. Um, but while you were speaking, and from what I, from the the introduction that I read online, there's so much overlap. Um, it's actually quite quite you know shocking, and I wish I I wish I'd had it before I published mine. But um, in terms of quasi coloniality, some of this actually goes back to the way in which Afghanistan is treated. Not just the northwest frontier, but all of Afghanistan is interpreted and acted upon as a sort of frontier space. So, you know, it is constructed as, the, as a margin, as a periphery, as something on the edges. And this is how Afghanistan, to go back to James Scott's language, is rendered legible. And the quasi-coloniality is the fact that Afghanistan has been subject to repetitive 
incursions and invasions, but it hadn't had the sort of colonial infrastructure, the colonial edifice of knowledge dedicated to it, the ways in which sort of settler colonial spaces have, or even other colonial spaces like India or Algeria had. So Afghanistan was sort of uh, this, if you were like, constructed as a buffer, as a constructed as an in-between space, uh, where we meet the meaningful entities of British India on the one hand, and Russia on, on the other. And this is also similar to other frontier spaces or other sort of quasi-colonial spaces like Iran. Iran was the other space, which was also, um, it had its own sort of um, problems and its also own sort of narratives around it, but, but was similar for Britain at the time. And then um, almost as though history repeats itself, that quasi-coloniality continued into the present. So the United States uh, also used very bitty information that Britain had um, on Afghanistan and used it and deployed it to render again, it's people legible. So it said, oh, you know, Afghanistan has always been tribal. There's these really sweeping generalizations, which we wouldn't usually associate with other places. And the sort of orientaliz orientalization of Afghanistan, which never really had, like I said, a knowledge edifice. Um, not that those knowledge edifices are, are always good. So, you know, India has been subject to some pretty, um, some pretty problematic assumptions and claims, but there has been some sort of, uh, recognition that this is a complex place, that there's, you know, a colonial anthropologist, but then also in, in Indian sort of knowledge through the subaltern school, etc., which has rendered India um, a place, a place that is worthy of being studied, worthy of being interacted with, whereas Afghanistan is just so just 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 a periphery, just a marginalized entity. And so that quasi-colonial status is one, recogn recognizing how violent some of those interventions and incursions have been, and two, recognizing how bitty or how superficial uh, they have been. And that, I think, captures the ways in which Afghanistan um, is interacted with or intervened upon both historically and contemporaneously. And I don't think this is specific or unique to Afghanistan, but I think Afghanistan is one of those places. And I suppose you could look at Libya or Yemen and make similar sorts of claims, of course, with their own distinctive um, histories. And I think that's the quasi. So it is colonial, but it's not quite colonial in the ways in which we have thought about the hegemony of colonization in, in spaces like India. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Nivi. Um, actually, I mean, I would like to ask you to probe a bit more about knowledge production, because at the heart of both of your books is the idea of knowledge production. And so, you know, in the historical sense, Tom, you have talked about how knowledge production was seen as a scientific project, and it was basically imperfect science that was posed as perfect science by these colonial subjects, uh, by the colonial agents. And I found your description of um, um, the barometers, and I think it's the, theo the what is it called? There's like an instrument for, and uh, the, litho um, the lithographs and stuff, which were so fragile, and yet they were used by these colonial agents, um, and they reported to their superiors saying that, you know, oh, we've got this all under control, by Joe, we're gonna do it. Um, but uh, actually these, Frontiers were super imperfect, and yet the post-colonial state takes it so seriously. Um, so I just wonder if you both want to comment on how these imperfect frontiers that were done in the historical sense is now taken by the securitizing state, which is obsessed with borders and citizenship determination. Um, that's just a question for both of you. Do you want to go first this time, Nivi? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to monopolize. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And I suppose for me, um, knowledge production actually has to do with what Robbie Shilliam calls knowledge cultivation. So there is loads of knowledge being produced, um, but some makes it to the top or some becomes sort of knowledge with a capital K. And um, Foucault talks about subjugated knowledges as well and sort of dominant discourses. So it's not that there is only one type of knowledge, but that one type of knowledge comes to dominate through uh, its, um, its um, acceptance in sort of the epistemic community. So you're talking about academics, practitioners, politicians, 
And in the case of Afghanistan, this is extremely fractured. Um, not, not that there's ever any consensus, but Afghanistan's knowledge production is really reliant on hackneyed tropes and, um, and on sort of these colonial, um, colonial imagery of tribesmen and women who don't know how to be themselves or are subjugated, et cetera. And what has happened is that that repetition of that knowledge um, doesn't make that come true, but it does make it um, shot through with anxiety. And that is something, because the more, the less knowledge you have, the more you have to perform a sort of um, arrogance around it. And in Afghanistan, that does see, as soon as you sc scratch that edifice, scratch the surface, it seems to sort of unravel itself. And that again has to do with its quasi-coloniality and with its sort of frontier status. Um, and so, so I'm interested in the ways in which knowledge uh, becomes the only way of knowing and how specifically in Afghanistan, it's really um, problematic and, and also um, fairly, if fairly um, surface, fairly sort of narrow. Um, and that, that to me is quite, quite telling. Um, it's, it's bizarre how there's this book called Afghanistan 101, which is less than 100 pages long, and it's given to development people to the, the US Navy and it says, you know, Afghanistan, Afghan people are basically very different from us. They don't understand, um, you know, they don't, they don't understand the rule of law. You need an authoritarian ruler. They don't, um, they don't like animals. They kill animals, uh, they beat their wives. And so the way to deal with Afghanistan, uh, Afghan, Afghans and Afghanistan is different from the ways in which you deal with civilized peoples. And then this gets just um, passed around um, to policymakers and then enacted on. And of course that has ramifications, material consequences for on the ground. And that's the sort of knowledge, knowledge as policy, knowledge as practice that I'm interested in. I think like what it's really interesting, like what you're just saying, I, I think resonates uh, with, with my work in that I, I think in so many cases, perhaps most conspicuously in sort of the, in ethnographic work in the 19th century, that kind of notion that all that really remains is stereotypes <laughs> and these very kind of shallow kind of, you know, shallow forms of knowledge. Um, it really rings true. Um, and I suppose what I try to look at, particularly, I guess, in the two uh, chapters of my book that deal with uh, field sciences, so one on surveys and maps and then the other on ethnographic work, is to sort of suggest that you know there there are sort of constant attempts through the nineteenth century to um, you know, to, to kind of achieve more depth <laughs> in colonial knowledge. There are you know an almost endless number of different schemes, um, you know forms of representation, ways of knowing you know, way, modes of depiction um, in particular. And, and I think the visual methods are really important as far as I'm concerned, um, that, are, that are suggested. Um, but so often they, they kind of descend into, you know, when actually sort of put into practice, they descend into these rather kind of hollow, empty enterprises um, that don't fulfill any of the promises, made, you know, the, the kind of promises attached to them at the outset. Um, and therefore, the kind of residue that's left at the end is exactly those forms of, you know, pretty hollow, empty, shallow <laughs> stereotypes. Um, and so th this, this, it strikes me as particularly the case in, in sort of, you know, visual ethnographic techniques, um, which go through, I, I tried to tr trace in the chapter how it goes through sort of various stages of um, kind of sketching, um, then, you know, different modes of photography, each of which are sort of bound up with different kind of technological um, setups, um, you know, the supposed possibilities that come with more portable cameras uh, taken to the field. Um, and, you know, what, what results is, is sort of avowedly, even on, you know, on the part of those who kind of started out by really extolling the virtues of, you know, in this case, um, photographic techniques, ends up sort of being, you know, conspicuously kind of underwhelming and inadequate as a, you know, a really robust means of, kind of 
you know, understanding, categorizing, you know, differences between uh, distinct groups. Um, and so what ends up happening, let's say, in the case of the Northwest uh, frontier, is just a kind of, uh, you know, a re-lumping together of, you know, an, a, a sort of vaguely essentialized type of Pashtun <laughs> um, and a vaguely essentialized type of Baluchi, despite these really sort of in-depth attempts to kind of separate and, and sub-categorize. Um, I think the, the equivalent in sort of surveys and maps um, it, for me is to look at how there, there are various kind of what in you know Kunian terms it could be termed paradigm shifts um, through the 19th century. So you start with kind of you know broadly with root surveying, and then trig surveying comes in, trigonometrical surveying which is initially applied to kind of frontier regions from a distance. And then in the later 19th century, trigonometrical surveyors increasingly, particularly when they're attached to military um, ventures, um, you know, enter into frontier spaces and conduct trigonometrical uh, survey measurements from within th frontier spaces. And each of those, you know, moments sort of by one rendering, um, by the Survey of India's own rendering, sort of represents, you know, a monumental step forward, <laughs> um, you know, a definitive improvement on what went before. And yet, in the very same documents, there are repeated, you know, allusions to the idea that, you know, often uh, the advent of, you know, what a uh, sort of a newer type of knowledge renders older types of knowledge seemingly defunct or dubious. Um, so, and the, the new types of knowledge themselves are beset by new types of problems <laughs> and limitations. So, you know, just to, again, take one example to sort of try to uh, demonstrate what I mean by this rather abstract point. Um, trigonometrical survey, uh, surveyors often find themselves, particularly in the Northeast, for instance, um, in, in what's now Naga Land, what was then Naga Hills District, um, they basically operate up in the clouds um, and when the clouds set in they're sort of reduced to basically being back as root surveyors um, and so that acknowledgement of the kind of limitations of you know this much heralded new technology is apparent um, there's one example that I'll mention just in closing um, of a trig an entire trigonometrical series so a sort of series of obs connected observations um, at the sort of northeast outskirts of the Assam Valley, um, being, in the words of the surveyor who conducted, you know, the initial um, survey, lost um, because they couldn't rediscover the location of the uh, trigonometrical marker that connected it to the rest of the series spreading through the subcontinent. So there are these sort of myriad kind of small but consequential failures <laughs> um, that totally undercut the claims that are made for um, these these ways of knowing um, by agents of, of empire. Um, anyway, I will, I, will, I will leave it there for now. I could waffle about science all day, uh, but yes. <laughs> I wish I could give you both more time and I wish we had another hour because there was so much more I wanted to ask you about gender, masculinity and the notion of tribe um, because those are heated um, topics. However, I shall sacrifice them because we do have audience questions and it would be remiss not to give them an opportunity. So um, I will be collating, I've already collated them. So I'm going to just read out some of the questions and forgive me because we only have 15 more minutes. So um, I'll just go right into it. Uh, Nivi, there's a question for you. Uh, and this is someone's question. I don't know who this question is from. So it says, I quote, why do you think that Afghanistan's place in the imperial imagination is under theorized? My question is more general to the study of gender in international politics. Most studies that adopt a gender lens do so from a Eurocentric perspective, which is something that you bring up in your, in your chapters as well, um, which is said to be lacking in understanding the complexities of other parts of the world, including South Asia. As someone who works in the space, what is your opinion on this and how do you navigate through it to bring about a truer South Asian picture in your work? Uh, I think this will give you a chance to talk about masculinity and feminism. And so please go ahead. Thank you. That's a really good question. And actually it has um, something in it which I think might um, help us answer the question of why 
Afghanistan has been under theorized. And one of it is, one of the things is that Afghanistan has never quite been thought of as um, part of any proper regional bloc. So it kind of moves between South Asia, the Middle East, Central Asia, um, and, and you know, there's been conferences and stud and things where Afghanistan doesn't feature. So it would be the Middle East would sometimes have Afghanistan in it. South Asia would sometimes have Afghanistan in it. So when you're talking about regional work or regional sort of an anthropological work or ethnographic work, Afghanistan kind of falls out of that picture um, because it's kind of quite specific. And because again, it has not been historically studied in the same depth as some other places, including the rest of South Asia. So Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, as part of sort of Britain, British uh, India. Um, and the gender lens is really interesting because again, um, South Asia is obviously a big subcontinent, but Afghanistan is uh, predominantly Islamic, although it's not considered a Muslim country. And that's because it's, I mean, it is considered a Muslim country, but it's often studied as a tribal country and, and a specific, specific codes of tribal, tribal um, being, including, for instance, Pashtun Valley, which then become um, sort of, re it's a quite a flexible code. It means certain things in certain spaces. It has vague notions about how to be a good host, etc., and but perhaps honor, but then it's just studied as this sort of rule or a sort of um, non-navigable um, way of being for all Afghans. And Afghans, again, Afghanistan is then studied as a, is a Pashtun society when actually it's a far more diverse place um, than just a Pashtun tribal society. So, um, uh, so I think the, the, the question of why there's a Eurocentric sort of gender lens is one, that there's a Eurocentric gender lens across the world. We are all based in Europe um, or, or in the US, which is sometimes considered part of Europe for, or whatever, Western Anglophone. And, um, and, and this is something I'm guilty of as well, is like we're, we're based in a certain space and then we're trying to make sense of another space through the sort of training we've already had in, sort, in, in some cases, gender theory or queer theory, which is very interesting to me, but has its, um, has it has its limits, and it certainly has its limits in in the sense that it's even in its sort of um, diversity tries to make sense of something on the ground without actually being on the ground. So there is a sort of divorce from what's actually happening. And my interest in that sort of Eurocentric gender theory is not to say, oh, this is the reality of gender in Afghanistan. It is rather to say, how are our assumptions about gender and gender normativity and gender norms? then imposed upon Afghanistan. So it, when they're imposed upon Afghanistan, Afghan women become objects of saving, Afghan men become perverse and pathological because they wear eye makeup, because they wear sandals, because they dress in a sort of colorful way, and because they hold hands. Because they hold hands, they're obviously homosexual, but they're not properly homosexual because they're so misogyn mis misogynistic. So there's all sorts of confusion around that. And I think that is because of a prescriptive Eurocentric gender norm uh, that that is true of even critical gender scholars um, and 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 they really do meet its limits um, because there is not the sort of ethnographic um, study also um, to back to back that and that's particularly problematic for Afghanistan but it's true of most places in general. That, that's a great answer, Nivi. And um, I mean, even in the study of Southeast Asia, we often have what is universal is actually on the phone and um, or even comparisons is always made with, um, you know, Western ideas of or at least an Anglophone idea of what is um, critical thought. So even that, that, I mean, and that's also problematic in Marxist studies also in, in some ways. Um, to, to move on to the next question is, uh, is for Tom. Uh, Tom, I was wondering, this, uh, they say, uh, quote, uh, I'm wondering if you could share your view on what is what is the frontier for Northeast India? Um, how far can the colonial how far can colonial power be blamed for the current frontier issues that India is facing? This is their question. Wow, that's a, a wide ranging one. Um, <laughs> so I suppose that part of I. I I'm really loathed. I, I'm, you know, 
I'm definitely not in any way a specialist <laughs> um, on contemporary frontier issues um, in the Northeast or Northwest. Um, and while I know that there are colleagues of mine, you know, among historians who have worked on, I mean, there, there are you know, historians and obviously others from other disciplines whose work takes them much closer to contemporary times and maybe better qualified than I am to give a view on how their work relates to you know contemporary issues M mine isn't particularly well uh well, well suited to that because it is a, you know substantially 19th century and very early 20th century focused um but the question i suppose of what constitutes the frontier in the northeast is i think a really interesting one considered you know from sort of let's say broadly 18, you know the 1820s and the british invasion uh, of an annexation of Assam um, through to, you know, the 1910s uh, and the formation of Northeast Frontier Tracts and so on. Um, insofar as, I mean, the, the sort of very short answer is what the frontier was to those agents of empire uh, across that period was radically different at different times um, and went, I suppose, broadly from uh, you know, in the very first instance, and this, by the way, is, you know, not my own sort of original claim by any means, it's just building on, you know, some fantastic scholarship on the region um, over, over many decades now, um, you know, went from being primarily fixated on, uh, you know, a supposed Burmese threat um, and, you know, being concerned primarily with sort of the eastern end of the Brahmaputra Valley um, to then kind of swinging you know then sort of swinging around to focus on what's now Nagaland <laughs> um, more substantially um, in the, the mid 19th century um, you know and then I guess what is now Arunachal you know only really came into view in a more sort of concerted way as far as the colonial state was concerned as of the sort of late 1900s that is the decade 1900s and early 1910s um, so where the frontier was what exactly it was, was very much up for debate. And clearly it changed. And I suppose someone like Gunnar Sadeloff's work is, is really, I think, instructive on this kind of, you know, th this early period. Um, also Jay Tisharma, um, the, you know, the, the effect of uh, kind of spreading tea plantations um, obviously is like utterly critical. <laughs> um, in, and, and then subsequently other processes of, uh, you know, capitalist extraction. Um, you know, uh, including various natural resources, um, is really crucial to kind of reshaping the Assam Valley and what counts as frontier and what doesn't. Um, so, you know, I, I would very much be sort of following <laughs> the work of others in making claims about that. Um, I mean, I think that, that there's a point that Mandy Sedan makes in the book Being in, Being and Becoming Kachin, which I alluded to in my kind of introductory remarks, um, to do with um, you know, the, the uh, Singfo community um, in Eastern Assam being kind of redesignated from, uh, you know, the foreign department uh, of the, the British colonial state, um, redesignated in the early 1840s to, you know, kind of interior <laughs> um, departments. Um, and th those kind of, you know, those kind of moments, I guess, represent a sort of broader shift within, you know, who and what counts as frontier um, and, and, who doesn't? Um, so it's certainly shifting as to, I mean, it, it, you know, as to the question of the sort of contemporary resonances, um, it's manifestly true that um, I suppose the, the combination of violence, upheaval and kind of incompleteness that marked colonial engagements with the Northeast frontier, um, you know, kind of has had residual and long lasting effects that continue to, you know, that sort of set a backdrop um, for, um, you know, continued modes of, of violence um, and, uh, yeah, state <laughs> community um, clashes in the region. Um, I don't think they, to you know, by any means kind of dictate the contours of those those clashes um, in, in detail, but they certainly set, you know, uh, an absolutely kind of essential backdrop to them. Um, and, you know, as others, I suppose, particularly thinking here, of, uh, you know, Sanjeev Barua, 
um, and probably in a slightly different vein, Berenice Goya Reshard um, have commented on the degree to which, you know, the post-colonial Indian state sort of acts as a colonial actor in the post-colonial period um, in portions of the Northeast. Um, and so their work is, you know, certainly much better to look to than mine is on this question <laughs> of the kind of uh, inheritances, um, uh, you know, from colonialism to the, to the post-colonial state. Thanks, Tom. Um, we only have five more minutes and just to make sure that, that there are a couple of questions that came directly to us. So um, whether or not you answer them, I'll just read them out. So just so you have them and maybe you can email back or something like that. So the first is, how has the nature of indigenous agency changed over time in the borderlands? And what does the future look like? That's the first question. And I'll just um, ask the last question is, the colonial objectification of Afghan and Afghanistan was in a way also dependent on the knowledge of the British that the British gathered from the Indian subcontinent. For example, um, I recall the time Mohanlal Kashmiri, who was one of the few colonial employees who survived the ghastly first Indo-Anglo-Afghan war, has written a massive book on Afghanistan. What would you then make of the role of the colonized subcontinent in reproducing imperial knowledge about Afghans Afghanistan that we find, say, in the archives today? So those two are the questions that came um, in as well. Um, please take a couple of more minutes um, because we can, we can extend this another five minutes. So please go ahead and answer those. Yeah, um, to, to tackle the second question, I guess, because I don't, yeah, that's probably more um, targeted at me in the first at, at Tom, but um, yeah. that, that is a really, really excellent question. And I feel like there's two, two parts to it. One, historically, because um, Brit British India has been the sort of jewel of the crown, if you like, uh, a lot of um, knowledge of Afghanistan is derivative on knowledge gathered in India and for India. So Afghanistan sort of becomes again that peripheral state or peripheral region to India and is made sense of by thinking of what's happened in India and what continues to happen in India. The second is in the contemporary times, um, India is not, is also in some ways acting as a colonial state, right? And this is certainly true when it comes to Kashmir, but also it has, it's branding itself as a, is as a sort of more powerful not just regional, but global actor. And some of the knowledge on Afghanistan um, that has come out of Indian newspapers and Indian media and Indian discourse has been very much uh, that this is a sort of backward uh, Islamic terrorist state on our borders and it needs to be dealt with as such. So this um, complicates the understanding of the coloniality of knowledge because it's not simply the old colonial powers but the shifting constellation of imperialism, which draws into it places that have been colonized themselves in the past. And I think India acts as a sort of colonial power in the region, and certainly the representations coming out of India, out of the Western sort of media, et cetera, or Westernized media are very much in the sort of same realm as the ones that have come out of the United States in the global war on terror, where the Islamic fundamentalist nature of Afghanistan is drawn upon, where its backwardness is commented on, whereas India posits itself as the sort of liberal westernized neighbor um, and, and has a sort of um, uh, paternalistic, uh, if you want to be kind, and, uh, and colonial, if you want to be perhaps more reflective um, of nature and relationship to Afghanistan. So thank you. That's a really, really good question. Jasneer, could, could I just, the internet just dropped out at the vital moment in the first question that you asked. Was it indigenous agency was the, the term that was used? Mm -hmm. Is that right? I'm just Sorry gonna... to put you on the spot. <laughs> and I, maybe I'll, I can start answering as if it was. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I mean, it says, they, uh, they say, how was the nature of indigenous agency, how has the nature of indigenous agency changed over, over time? But I don't think, yeah, yeah. so they meant, yeah. Okay, uh, um, <laughs> the question of uh, sort of change over time is one that I'll try to come to, but my, my initial thought was to, I, and I suppose it's to, to highlight something that I, I'm interested in sort of in this book, but also in work that I've, I've done subsequently, which looks primarily at kind of field sciences, and is part of, I, I guess, a broader move in 
history of science to um, explore the kind of absolutely fundamental role of you know non-European actors in the making of you know Euro Western sciences, <laughs> um, particularly field sciences um, in you know locations outside of Europe and the West. Um, and I think in in that respect, one of the kind of I suppose if there's this kind of archetypal move that um, almost conceptual move that um, you know imperial men of science undertake, um, which is evident certainly across various frontiers across the entire period that I study and I think you know definitely persists beyond, which is basically an utter reliance on indigenous agency um, to construct knowledge in everything from you know a whole array of like really quotidian ways so um you know th like a thorough reliance uh when surveying in let's say the northeast on um you know unpaid uh, coerced labor um to you know enable survey measurements to be taken um so there's the reliance aspect and but then there's you know a concerted attempt to then totally occlude that reliance <laughs> um and to to write you know write the reliance out of um the the reports that then show up in the imperial archive um and, and to sort of systematically underplay how significant the reliance was um and what i i suppose i've been interested in, in work actually subsequent to the book primarily but i think it does show up is the, in in the book is the degree to which um that reliance goes beyond you know goes far beyond just kind of the, the more you know kind of physical mundane realities of doing science in the field um and ultimately includes kind of conceptual reliance um so if we to look at um understandings of geographical discovery around you know the yalom sangpo brahmaputra river um uh, across the 19th and early 20th centuries um i would argue that at each stage you know british colonial knowledge is kind of critically dependent on various different um different sort of cosmologies uh, that apply in uh, along different portions of the river river's course um, but again there's this kind of generally concerted attempt to occlude and suppress that reliance <laughs> um, so I guess I would argue that perhaps most striking of all in relation to that specific question of how does it change over time and this is viewing it from a very narrow narrowly construed you know history of science kind of perspective um, Actually, one of the most striking things is the, the degree to which in its broad outline, it doesn't change that much over time. And actually it remains very much the case, even with a move, you know, even with the move to more kind of technologically sophisticated modes of doing field science, such as trigonometrical surveying, which might be expected to reduce the reliance on indigenous agency in frontier regions. In fact, it doesn't go away at all um, and remains very much in place. So that would be one potential way of <laughs> beginning to answer that question, but it's a really rich, uh, you know, really rich thing. We're two minutes um, out of time, so I'm going to go, although there's so much more to talk about, but Rona Joy, um, I'll just pass this to you to say a few words and thank you very much, Nivi, Tom, and, and our audience. And we've taken all of the audience questions, so uh, barring if there is any more, we will send it to you and email it to you as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jasnia, uh, Nivi, and Tom for the thought provoking discussion. Uh, besides throwing up new concepts and ideas, I think the discussion allowed us to revisit and reimagine some of the themes of the annual conference, such as Curzon's famous or infamous, if you will, 1917 lectures on frontiers at Oxford that cropped up both in the conferences opening panel discussion, as well as a round table on the Duran line. This contrasts with the often haphazard nature of frontier making and mapping and the so-called wild nature of frontier region, which feeds into the policies of the successor states of the British Empire and British India. One could cite several such examples, but unfortunately time does not permit me to list them. Before handing over the floor to Claudia, I'd also like to thank our partner for the event Conrad Adenau Stiftung, or KAS, my colleagues at ISAS who make today's and the earlier events possible, 
and the audience for showing up and robustly engaging with Nivis and Thomas's books, as well as the conference theme in general. Over to you, Claudia, for the final words of wisdom. Thank you, Dr. Rona Joy and Justnia for moderating the session. And special thanks to Dr. Tom and Dr. Nivi for the interesting discussion today. I personally enjoy both of your books as well. To the audience, we are excited to like to thank you for your participation today. And this book discussion marks the end of our international conference on South Asia 2021. We hope to see you at future events. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Uh, good morning in wherever you are. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.